are very fortunate to have Professor Tutan to step into the breach and to present uh, this presentation on what damage can long-term use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory horses be to horses. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I received the mail yesterday at 10 p.m. And nobody can replace Johanna Fingremels. I will attempt to do that now. Ten minutes, not more. Okay. Yana start, as everybody, with the question of COX-1, COX-2. You know now COX-2 is overexpressed during inflammation on the good anti-inflammatory drugs, suprex COX-2, but if possible, does not suppress COX-1, that is a housekeeping enzyme. It has been explained by Professor Michael Wright, etc. So the main message of Yana, all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are not equal, regarding COX-1 versus COX-2 inhibition. We have some non-selective COX inhibitors, and mainly the old one, aspirin, frunixine, phenibutazone. Aspirin is very interesting because aspirin is a COX-1 inhibitor when it is injected. But if you administrate aspirin by oral route, it becomes a COX-2 because it is immediately metabolized to salicylic acid that is more COX-2. So it's maybe very complicated. Or normally, the, the, the dose is administered by oral round. Then, we have more preferential COX-2 inhibitors. It is the case of profen. It depends on the, the measurement of the in vitro system. And as Professor McIlwright said, historically, carprofen has not been used because it's not very potent. And as Ludovic explained, potency and efficacy are two different words having not the same meaning. A drug can be very potent and not efficacious, or very efficacious and non-potent. So in the literature, we have a lot of confusion on that. More selective meloxicam, but not enough to totally separate COX-1 versus COX-2. And currently, the only drug that we have in veterinary medicine for ours that is totally selective is thyrocoxib that has been marketed by Merial, I think it's Equiox. It is now marketed in Europe also. Never forget also that some COX-2 may be useful. COX-2 is expressed in the brain, is expressed in the reproductive tract, and COX-2 may be useful for healing. And in some models, it has been shown that to inhibit COX-2, delay healing. Okay, on tepoxaline, this is the dual mechanism of action. You suppress not only the COX pathway, but the lipooxygenase pathway, and may be very useful for some inflammatory, for example, lungs inflammatory. Okay. So, what is the possible side effects of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs? Johanna said, historically, it has been investigated by drenching, by administrate high dose of phenibutazone, for example, it has been done in ponies, and we observe a lot of side effects, in appetence, uh, weight loss, etc. But she said, the value of this kind of experimentation is not very useful for us because we, we inject, we, we administer the drug to very high level. In a normal condition, for phenibutazone, for example, one of the first side effects is anorexia. So the horse stopped to eat, and of course it stopped to expose itself to phenibutazone. This is the two main side effects of, of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs on gastrointestinal tract and on the kidney. On the gastrointestinal tract, two possible actions of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, a direct one or a pharmacologic one. The direct one, it is the irritation on the gastric mucosa. I think this is not very relevant in horse for many reasons. And one of the reasons is Phenibutazone, phenixine, tolphenamic acid are strongly bound to the cellulose of A, and we have no direct contact. And it is only in the direct, in the last part of the digestive tract, in cecum and colon, when you have cellulose that these drugs are released, in fact, explaining some side effects as colitis, etc. More importantly, the side effects on gastrointestinal tract is a, is a pharmacological effect. It is because you inhibit COX-1. And I would like to, to, to make a comment on that. The, when you administrate several anti-inflammatory drugs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, 
It is possible to, to, to have a more efficacious results, not always, but you are sure to increase also the side effects because the side effects are additive at that level. Okay, we'll see some other slide on that. On the second side effects, and nobody speak about that, is the kidney side effects. <laughs> Prostaglandins are useful to control the blood circulation in the kidney, especially when there is a challenge at the level of the kidney. So, if you have a horse in colics, for example, or during a dehydration, it could be very dangerous to have also some anti-inflammatory drugs. It has been shown for flunixin, for phenylbutazone, etc. So this is an interaction between the water status, the hydration status, and the anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay. Now, Johanna addressed more specifically uh, what is the evidence of side effects on the gastrointestinal tract for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And what she said, what she said, uh, prevalence not recorded. I think it's not totally true because this is one of my slides, the next one. Look, uh, animal welfare. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, I, I will show a little bit uh, another slide. Okay. There was a, a, a Swedish survey about 25 years ago on more than 3,000 horses. And they show the, the, the non serodol anti-inflammatory drugs were not associated with the prevalence of ulceration. And we know now that ulceration are mainly a question of the feeding system and the horse management that, than the question of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Another side effect is the uh, effect, sorry, is the effect uh, plop, plop, on thromboxane on uh, the question of uh, the risk uh, to, to increase hemorrhagia or, to, or to, to, to modify blood coagulation. Currently, we have no evidence that detrimental clinical side effects of that. Okay, perhaps a specific mention for aspirin. When you inject aspirin by IV, the effect on blood coagulation is more than one day. Other side effects. Okay. What is the evidence for renal influence on non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs? Currently, Johanna said we have no data, and I think it's true. And what she said, a possible issue is for endurance. For endurance, the, 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 the race is very long, it's quite possible to have some kind of imbalance, a water imbalance. And if you add some anti-inflammatory drugs in this kind of horse, it's possible to have some side effects. But frankly, we have not in the literature a survey on that. The question of performance has been addressed by several people and will be discussed again. And what said Johanna, if, of course, if you have some lameness or if you have some injury, it's quite possible that you improve performance. But it will be extensively explained uh, this afternoon by themselves, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are not able to improve performances. Risk of an injury on the injury progression. This has been presented this morning. I will not be back here with the Kentucky survey. And nobody, everybody knows now what is the possible effect on a long-term basis of some plasma concentrations that are quite high, 5 versus 2 micrograms per milliliter for phenylbutazone, for example. Okay, so in summary, what she said, we have few evidence of a very strong side effect with non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and it is my opinion that we have a lot of in vitro studies with many other statements and not enough epidemiological survey. And I think clinicians are encouraged to perform survey. The only way to know if there is some side effects that are the relevance is to perform epidemiological survey, not to discuss uh, a small action on, on some tissue or something like that. So this is a presentation of you and me. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tutan.